It's not an accident that the Messiah is described as a tree or a branch. Interesting enough, he's crucified on a tree. Okay, the, the concepts mean something. Cosmology, again, does not conform to literal expectations, but it's going to communicate really important, and I would say pretty cool, ideas. So I use this illustration, and it's the best one I could find. And look, for those of you who are into like comparative mythology, yes, I know this comes from the Norse gods, okay? I know that, but I, I like it. <laughs> it's the best one I could find. This is a picture of the world tree. This was an idea, again, that is you know, present in lots of ancient cultures. Remember the three-tiered cosmology we talked about in weeks past, where we've got the earth, and then there's the firmament, there's waters above the earth, below the earth, the earth you know, emerges from the waters and all this stuff, and then there's below the earth, okay, this kind of language. Uh, three-tiered cosmos, don't make images of anything on the earth or that is above the earth or under the earth. You get it in Exodus 20, which is the Ten Commandments. You get it in the New Testament, Philippians 2. In case I'm doing a really terrible job, you know, quoting it, let's go to Philippians 2.10 just so that you get the flavor of it. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Okay, it's a three-tiered reality system, three-tiered cosmology. This is what I'm talking about. Now, in the ancient world, this is the conception they had. You had the world above. Again, and this is another place that the gods live because people don't. They're not earthly. Supernatural beings are not earthly. So this isn't where they belong. Okay? They can come here, but it's not really where they belong. So we've got the world up there, we've got the world we experience, and then we've got the world where we go when we die. The underworld, Sheol, again, these, these concepts, the words actually mean something, underworld. It actually reflects, again, the cosmology. The idea was that these three things are connected by a polar axis, which the ancients called a world tree. Their conception was, again, that there's this huge axis that goes all the way through all three and connects everything. It connects everything. It holds the cosmology together. It's the chief pillar under the earth or the chief pillar of the sky, again, to, to borrow a little biblical language. Now, what might you think of the place that was right in the middle. Would that be an important place? Because that's the place where heaven and earth meet. And that's the place where if we want access to the dead to hopefully make them alive, that's where that would happen. Jerusalem in biblical theology is the center of the earth. It is the place where the entire cosmos connects and is maintained, specifically Jerusalem. This is why there's a temple there. This is why it's a garden. This is why it's a mountain. This is, this is it was God's dwelling. He holds all things together. Now for a Mesopotamian, it was Marduk. Okay, for an Egyptian, it was somebody, you know, and these change in polytheistic systems, this changes depending on the popularity of a certain deity at a certain time. You know, well, we had a drought for the last hundred years, that deity stinks, you know, we need a better one, you know. So again, somebody else will take the top position and they were okay with that. Polytheistic systems are okay with that kind of thinking. They just adapt. So we've got Ezekiel 38. 12, another example, Ezekiel 5, 5, thus says the Lord, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the center of the nations. Ooh, now we get the nations in the picture. With countries all around her. 
and unfortunately she has rebelled against my rules. If anybody should be walking with me, and if there should be harmony at any place, it should be this one, and it ain't there. Even this place is corrupt. The tree above the ground. Well, if we're in primeval texts, that's the tree of life. Where else would there be life? It's where God is. God is the source of life. You know, there are, there are texts in, in Judaism that talk about the tree of life sealing up or being over, shutting off the realm of the dead. Again, if all, when you read something like that, if all you can think about is, oh, I wonder what that looked like, like if I went up and scraped a little bark off of it. Look, that isn't the point. The point is the ideas that the God of Israel is the source of life. He, is the, he holds the, the, the keys to life and death. He creates and he destroys. Okay, nobody else does that. Because he, and he lives here. This is where his house is, the tree of life, all this stuff. And again, when you get the tabernacle and you get the temple, this is why the imagery of this central place is preserved. It's also why later in eschatology, it's brought back. And isn't it curious? Isn't it curious to go down to the Messiah line there? It's not an accident that the Messiah is described as a tree or a branch. Interesting enough, he's crucified on a tree. Okay, the, the concepts mean something. Let me just click out here. This, again, this is why I said I could, I could spend my whole life in Genesis 1 through 11. 